Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Drew. It's great to see you here. In this channel, we are studying learning functional anatomy. So if you're a massage therapist, a body worker, a personal trainer, a movement fitness coach, or if you just happen to have a real interest in anatomy, then this is the channel for you. Also, very cool to see, we've got some visual artists, people studying life drawing who have sent some comments through saying they're really enjoying it for their life drawing, which is really cool because in another form of life, I actually study visual arts and uh, spent a lot of time in life drawing, uh, studying anatomy, and uh, particularly looking like from beginning from things like uh, Andreas Versalis, who's one of the first anatomists. So if you uh, want to go back to look at his work, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so I really appreciate it. One of the really great things about human anatomy is it's like it's uh, once you learn it, it's pretty much applicable right across the board. There are some kind of subtle variations. Every now and again, we get extra extra bones, like sometimes you'll get an extra vertebrae, you know, like a, a six lumbar vertebrae, uh, things like that. But typically we're all pretty much, we're, we're probably more same than we are different in that regard. Anyway, so we're looking at uh, the bicep group and today we're looking at this amazing little muscle here called coracobrachialis, which in my opinion is the most forgotten about muscle within the bicep groups. Most people when you kind of ask them about a coracobrachialis, they go like, what are you talking about? Um, and again, it's like one of those little things I say is that the bicep groups is not very well kind of labeled because it's just, there's four muscles in the biceps muscle group. So there's coracobrachialis, we've got bicep brachy, uh, a long and short head, and we also got the brachialis and then uh, brachioradialis. So there's four muscles, maybe five if you count bicep brachy as two separate heads. <clears throat> anyway, so let's look today at this little bad boy. Let me just take a sip of my coffee here. Ah, caffeine nectar of the gods. Not quite sure which is better, caffeine or whiskey. Um, I suppose it depends on the day, time of day. So as always, we look at attachments points first because that's going to inform when the muscle contracts what bone it's going to pull on and then the muscle contracting pull the bone creates the movement. So if we start with the proximal attachment, what we have here is the coracobrachialis attached to the coracoid process here, which is this part of the of the scapula here. So coracoid process, coracobrachialis. So that's kind of where the name comes from. And then we also follow it down and it's going to attach onto our humerus about midpoint. And it's essentially the same level that the deltoid, the deltoid's on the lateral aspect, coracobrachialis is on the medial aspect. Now, one really cool thing about the coracoid process is this three muscles that attach here. We have coracobrachialis, we have pec minor, which comes down through here. And then we also have one of the bicep brachy muscles on the short head comes through here as well. So this region here is really, really important in shoulder health and mechanics because if this muscle coracobrachialis gets tight or if pec minor gets tight or bicep bracket gets tight, they typically will go three together. They pull your shoulder blade forward, down, and in. So you essentially what you get is this pinned shoulder. So we have scapular protraction, scapular depression, or elevation, depending on what's going on with the traps, and then internal rotation. And then you get a com com compromised kind of shoulder mechanics. So this muscle here is one of the forgotten ones, and you need to definitely address it. When I'm working with a lot of folks with shoulder issues, nine out of 10 people, they're just going to be really tight through here because we have this kind of flexion pattern when we get an injury, we tend to kind of like go into the fetal position, that's a flexion pattern, so everything kind of tightens up. And so we want to kind of unwind that. And that's uh, initially, it's a way of the body protecting itself, but then after tissue is healing, healed, we want to then basically allow the body to be restored back to full range of movement and how it holds more health. But it's something to be aware of this little muscle here. Now, um, nerve supply is going to be coming out. Let's have a look at the nerve supply. So again, we're, we're on our 3D for anatomy. Um, I'm not paid for this. This is just a great app 
we're scratching the surface. We're only looking at the muscular system here. All right, you can see we've got all the different um, systems of the body there as well. So you can really go into quite a lot of detail and depth. And just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of the, the nerve supply. So this nerve actually just threads through this muscle. So when this muscle gets tight, you can get neurological issues coming down through here. And this nerve is, I think it's the musco. Let's have a look. What is it? The, uh, do, 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 do. Dun, 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 dun. I'm trying to highlight the nerve. What nerve is it? Yeah, the musculocutaneous nerve, which is basically the one that comes down the middle of your forearm here. So your pins and needle kind of issues you get here, a lot of kind of carpal tunnel problems. Potentially, it could be from this tight coracobrachialis mechanism here, because if that might, it's like perifor piriformis syndrome, but for your shoulder. And all, as it's coming out of the neck, multiple levels of the neck. So we've got here uh, C7, C6, C5. So at any one of those levels, you can get a nerve root kind of compromised through here. And then you've also got this potential of getting the brachial plexus compromised between the collarbone and the first and second rib as well. So there's lots of potential to have neurological stuff happening. And when you're working with people, particularly with the elbow and with the wrist, if you, can, if you just do a quick little assessment of their neck and shoulders, if you palpate or if sometimes you can see really obviously you can just kind of like eyeball it, they're really tight, their kind of shoulders are elevated, they're internally rotated, they're very stiff. But often a lot of the problems will be coming not from the wrist but from the neck and shoulders. And a lot of kind of carpal tunnel issues is uh, IT workers, people that do a lot of sedentary work, uh, and they're in a slightly flexed hunch position. So you can see how that compromises that. And I've actually managed to, um, I think it's three people now who were scheduled to have a couple of surgery. And then before they did the surgery, they just kind of like wound up seeing me for uh, whatever reason. I'm usually a bit of a last resort for a lot of folks. <laughs> um, and we did, and all three of them basically at the carpal tunnel was, yeah, they had some issues down here, but it was all generated from the neck and shoulders. Once we did worked on that, basically carpal tunnel goes away. So just remember to look up and be, be above and below, below the joints where possible. So that's the nerve supply coming through here, the musculocutaneous nerve. Now we want to look at movement. So isolate that. Let's go to motion and we'll look at the two movements. I think there's actually three really, and I'll explain to that as we go along. So the first thing we have here is shoulder flexion. So remember when you're kind of like thinking about movement, consider one at one air, one end is going to be relatively stable and fixed. So we'll say that the shoulder blade region is the relatively fixed position. And then when the muscle contracts, it's gonna pull up this way. So it's gonna pull the arm upwards in this plane. So it's gonna pull it up and this is shoulder flexion. So this is going to be working with your, uh, your uh, deltoids. Yeah, so you, you can get some deltoid action going on through there. It's definitely gonna be working with your Biceps. So you're, where are they? Bicep brachial tendon. That's the tendon. There we go. We got the bicep brachial here. And we haven't talked about serratus anterior yet. We're definitely going to be doing a video on this, but serratus anterior is one of those really, really important muscles. And this is a good example of it here. So to get your arm overhead, the serratus anterior does this kind of lower movement of the shoulder blade and it kind of it gives it that scoop up and under and when that can combines with the anterior deltoid the bicep brachii that enables you to get your arm above the head now if you look at the movement of the, sh the uh, shoulder blade here and the clavicle see how that all moves up so if, if your shoulder is pinned down so if you had that that tight kind of pec minor or the coracobrachialis was tight it's through here. You're not, the shoulder blade is not going to be able to lift up and under into that nice movement. So it's going to be pinned. So you're going to get everything jammed up and then you're just not going to be able to get your arm above your head. 
So it's always one of the goals when we, when we work in shoulder rehabilitation is to get the arm into full flexion. And that's basically, you should be able to get your hands above your head if the arm's straight. Think diving. So get your arm behind your ear. <laughs> my, my limbs are disappearing. Uh, yeah, get your arm behind your ear, hands up straight, nice neutral arm posture, and that's full shoulder range of movement. And you can do that lying down on the floor. So you lie on your back, bend your knees up, so your feet are flat and knees bent. That's going to neutralize your spine. And you should be able to get your back of your hands on overhead onto the floor without arching and flaring up through the middle of your spine. And that's a good indicator that you've got full shoulder range movement. Then you want to train that full shoulder range movement with strength exercises. So that's the shoulder flexion. Let's go and have a look now at a deduction. Adduction. So let's fade them all. Here we go. So here we're in shoulder abduction. So abduction means to take away from midline. So adduction means add, bring together. So we're going to bring the arm down towards the midline. So as the muscle contracts, it's going to pull the arm down by the side. So from overhead, up here. Now, the muscle that's going to help you do that, of course, is the latissimus dorsi. So let's put that on. And on the front, pec major. So we've got these two big muscles. So we've got lat, lat dorsi, pec major, coracobrachialis here. Now, they are all attaching on the inside of the arm or the medial aspect of the arm. So they're going to have a rotation component to the, to the shoulder or an internal rotation. So as it comes down, it's not showing it in this diagram, which is probably not real to light. You can do it. You can keep your thumb kind of just pointing out and come up and down, like you can do that. But typically what will happen is that the pec and the lat will internally rotate humerus okay, which predisposes because of this line that's in front of the shoulder okay it it's going to pull this whole scapular mechanism forward into protraction and then when you add in the lat pulling down into depression and then the pec major pulling in this way into adduction you get this kind of pinning and then you get the pec minor and the um, bicep brachii as well. So that's how we can get into trouble. And you can see this like, you know, the typical guys who are overdeveloping their chest in the gym and they, they have a big chest and then they kind of develop a, a flexed, they walk around, the elbows are constantly flexed. <laughs> so they're constantly bent. And that just means that they, they're training their arms but not training to full range of movement. And there's probably overdeveloped the, the chest and the lats uh, are thinking they're doing the right thing in training. And if that's their goal, then, then yeah, they probably have. But they're not training to full range of movement. And so then the muscles, because these are so big and so powerful, they just override and you create that internal rotation and that pinning. And the problem with that is it just kind of creates some kind of shoulder dysfunction down the track. And if you're trying to do overhead pressing movements, you don't have the range of movement, the range is going to come through the neck or it's going to come through the lumbar spine. And so essentially what happens is you get a neck, neck injury or you get a lower back injury typically. Okay. And then we need to kind of like figure that out. So that's pretty cool. And so the third movement would then be internal rotation. So because the coracoid, uh, coracobrachialis is on this kind of inside medial part of the humerus as it pulls up here it's going to create that kind of that spin in internal rotation so that is one of the most overlooked muscles in the body particularly in the upper limb if we just put in the other muscles while we're here so let's put in bicep brachii bicep brachii just get me out of the way. Bicep brachy left. Okay. 
So the bicep brachy here, so the short head sits under the coracobrachialis. So you can't really see it. So it's difficult to palpate because you've got to go through in this one here. So if we kind of fade that one out, so it's sitting on top of your coracobrachialis there. So it can be a little bit di difficult to palpate. Good massage therapists, they can. So essentially what they do is, you, with takes experience and practice, but essentially you can kind of feel the other muscle underneath. Um, and so you palpate it by gently going through the top layers first. You kind of can't really push these muscles aside to access it. And so then as you're massaging or palpating through the bicep brachy, you, you kind of by association are getting into the lower layer beneath that as well. It's kind of like when you're doing the back extensors, they kind of like, they layer on top of each other. So you kind of work from the top layer down, middle layer down to the bottom layer. And that takes a real real skill from a massage therapist to be able to feel the quality of the tissue and to slowly work down into layers and not to be too aggressive because you don't want to go straight down into that. You've got to kind of like warm up this tissue first to access the one below it. Uh, and then if you put in brachialis, B-R-A-C-I-A-C-I-A-L-S, brachialis. Brachialis. Some reason it keeps spinning it around like that, which is kind of annoying. I do like this app for ED for Medical, but it can be sometimes frustrating to use. I'm not going to lie. The benefits far, far outweigh the negatives, though. So here we have brachialis. So if we fade away our bicep brachii again, then you've got our brachialis here. So this is the three big movement muscles in the elbow. And we haven't done brachioradialis yet. And we'll do that in the next video. So that here is the three bicep muscles combined. So when you're training your biceps, you've got to train movement at the shoulder, movement at the elbow, and you've also got to train movement at the radius as well, so supinating grip. So that typically explains the three different kind of bicep movements you do. You will do a movement where the uh, you, you stay in pronation, so the palm forward, Okay, that's more just a straight curl. It's more for your bicep uh, brachialis. And then you go from pronation to sumation. So that you do a, a turn to your thumb goes out. Okay, and that will get your um, bicep brachy, the one attached onto the radius in the thumb side. And then you also want to then do as you curl and then elbow flexion to get the, the head that can track that kind of kind of crosses here. So you're getting both bicep brachy and the corrigobrachialis. So essentially, if you're doing a good bicep workout, you want to do isolated curls, the four inch movement, if elbow, full elbow flexion to extension. You want to do full elbow flexion extension from pronation to supination, so a turn, turn of the hand. Okay. Uh, you want to do elbow flexion and then shoulder flexion for a slight bit of internal rotation just to get that on a coracobrachialis. And then when we do bicep uh, brachioradialis, you want to do that. That's the basically with the thumbs up curl or the hammer curl. That's going to focus on that. So essentially, you need to do four different exercises to really get the full shoulder, elbow, wrist component of bicep brachy. And that's why we study functional anatomy. So when you're prescribing exercises, one, you know, how to prescribe a strength exercise, whether it's a, a dumbbell or a kettlebell or a system band, uh, a barbell, whatever it is. So you know how to set it up and which angles to go onto. Then you know how to stretch it. So just simply stretch these muscles, you reverse the action. So if you want to stretch bicep brachy, bicep brachy is an elbow flexor, you simply extend the elbow and that'll get stretch out bicep um, brachialis. If you want to get into coracobrachialis, you need to extend the elbow and then also extend the arm. And if you want to get even more because it's an internal rotator, then you want to 
turn your thumb out, external rotation, to get the bicep full uh, stretch on the bicep. And then if you try to stretch your bicep brachii because um, bicep brachii is a supinator, even then you want to pronate the arm, take the arm into full extension. Okay, so that's thumb in, palm back to stretch into that bicep there. So then functional anatomy, then you know, that'll explain how to stretch and strengthen. And then it's also how you do manual muscle testing as well. So if you want to, if you want to test bicep brachialis versus coracobrachialis, what you got to do is, is basically you would to get this muscle here, for example, you isolate it by bringing the elbow forward a little bit. So when you, when you flex it, the, the muscle that does mostly elbow flexion is going to be dominant. So then you do a resisted elbow flexion movement. And typically what will happen is the muscle that's in the best position to contract will, will be the one that contracts. And so then if there's a tear or if there's something going on there, when someone goes to squeeze it or contract it, it'll create pain or discomfort, and then you'll get that feedback. Uh, same thing if you're trying to then test out whether you're doing bicep brachii, okay, then you would need to actually start in full extension, in full elbow extension and shoulder flexion, and then do a resisted curl up into elbow flexion, shoulder flexion. Okay? And then you'll get a bit of a sense of where it is. You combine those with palpation. So palpating, usually if there's an injury in the muscle, there'll be a very sore sensory spot and then you can feel the spot. And so you, when you combine those pieces of information together, plus you know the, the history that someone tells you, you can kind of start to figure out what potentially it may be. Keep in mind, there's some interesting research looking at palpation and palpation is not a very accurate way of diagnosing tissue <laughs> um, because you're really trying to feel bony landmarks and everyone's kind of bony landmarks are slightly different shaped and orientated and positioned. So nothing is exactly the same. So there's some interpretation that goes into that. So ideally what we do is we match history with physical assessment, uh, mental muscle testing, movement testing, what the person tells us, palpation, and then possibly depending if we feel it's necessary, um, referral out for imaging and stuff like that if we need that if you've got access to that uh, so it just depends that's why we do all the training so that when we work with people we can kind of differentiate between what's going on and where we need to start our work okay so that's bicep brachy coracobrachialis so from the coracoid process the part of the scapula down to the kind of midway down the medial aspect of the humerus. And it's purely a shoulder flexure, flexion muscle and a shoulder adduction muscle and internal rotation muscle. If you found uh, this video helpful, uh, I ask one favor or maybe a couple of favors, uh, definitely like and share. And what really helps is any comments. So anything that's not being made clear, or if you've got a further question or just a, a comment, say cheers, and you know, that's all really great. One, it gives me a little bit of a dopamine to hit to know that people are, are enjoying the content. It's helping them that really, you know, for me, that's really very rewarding um, as a teacher. Like when students are digging what you're doing, it's really cool. So yeah, if you find it helpful, let me know, that's amazing. Also, too, it also helps with the YouTube algorithm. Um, YouTube likes it when people are interacting and commenting. So, because it's basically telling the YouTube that people are liking it. And the goal of the channel is to kind of like share this inf information. And support 3D for medical. So definitely go to their website, check out their stuff. If you're a student of anatomy, I highly recommend you grab it. Um, it's not that dear. You know, there's lots of different levels you can kind of jump into it as well. And I'll see you in the next video. We'll look at the last bicep muscle group, which will be uh, having a mind blank. <laughs> I don't want to go down to the wrist. Uh, bicep, uh, bicep radial. Jeez, having a total mind blank. So let's have a look. Let me put it in. Me no anatomy good. There it is. Nope, that's not it. Where is it? Brachialis left. Where is it? 
There it is. <laughs> right here, right here, Alice. Well, I'm blank. <laughs> There's also another interesting thing. Um, back when I was a studying anatomy, you had to rope memorize all this stuff. So you just have to repeat it over and over again in your head until this is basically hardwired into your brain somewhere. Now it's the skills, not so much memorization of information, which is handy. Like re repetition is the mother of learning. So the more you go over it, the more it kind of makes sense. So I think you need to do that to a certain level, but also don't get too caught up on the on the minutia of the details because we now have this access to information like never before. So really, this, the new skill, in my opinion, is not rope, rope memory memorization of information. Although you still need to do that to a certain level and be very familiar with the what you what you're studying, but also it's like how to study, how to learn, where to get the information from. Okay. So in this context. 3D for medical is a great app. And then someone like myself, who can kind of help make sense of the app and how to use it and what you do with it and then how to apply to real life. I think that's the next thing as well. Okay. So if you find that helpful, let me know. Otherwise, we'll see you next video. Cheers, have a great day.